Testing? Ooh, that's loud. All right. How are you guys doing today? My name is Davis Phillips, and this is Chandler Wilkerson. We work for a solution engineering at Red Hat, and we've been working on a product called CubeFed. CubeFed will basically allow you to take out single, multiple clusters and manage them as one. So Federation of the product in Kubernetes, um, it's kind of been a redone. There was a V1, now there's a V2 of the product. It's still kind of in tech preview for OpenShift as a product. But in Kubernetes, basically the, the respin allows you to manage multiple clusters um, from a single control plane. Now, how does it work with GitOps? Um, GitOps is a relatively new concept that uses um, a Git repo as a source of truth for your infrastructure and deployments. It's not a new concept in Kubernetes or in OpenShift, but it's a newer concept from an infrastructure perspective. Um, we'll be on to a demo at some point, and lastly, a Q&A session. I covered it already. All right, so the disclaimer is KeepFed's still a work in progress. It is very much still a uh, alpha product, it's not even beta yet. Um, there may be some changes over the, how the product works today. Um, basically, the idea is the same, but the inception may be changing over time. Um, and then, lastly, backwards compatibility is not assured until it hits beta in 010. So our architecture today looks like this. We have uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters or OpenShift clusters on different platforms. Um, cloud provider A could be vSphere, OpenStack, um, AWS, GCP, um, even bare metal. Um, all of these clusters are managed independently, and typically you'd have uh, infrastructure endpoints either to get traffic into the clusters or to load balance around the clusters. But no real, real way to sync the clusters or sync applications around the clusters. So tomorrow's idea is a hybrid cloud with Kubernetes having a control plane that manages all three clusters. Um, the control plane will allow you to roll out and migrate applications between the clusters seamlessly um, using Kubernetes concepts like deployments. Some of the problems they're trying to solve with Federation is having that unified control plane for all applications. Because right now, like I said, it's all independently managed. Some high availability for applications, being able to move from data center to data center with limited or no downtime. Um, disaster recovery. Um, geographically dispersing load balancing between applications and data centers. And then application portability. Kind of being able to move your application around where you need it, when you need it, based on demand. So at Red Hat, the people working on the Federation product, we have an involvement from CTO, um, Systems Engineering, our group, um, the engineering group writing the binaries for it, the storage team for our storage backend, and then networking in other groups for both interconnects between the clusters and then ingress, egress points from clustering. And then lastly, Federation V2 is a SIG open source, source upstream product. some vocabulary for federation. Um, essentially, I kind of covered a little bit this before, but a multi-clusters multi or lots of single, multiple clusters, they're, in, they're not aware of each other. There's no workload management. There could be CI, CD pipelines that manage between those clusters, but for the most part, they're all completely independent of one another. We explored the idea of a stretch cluster, which is taking a single cluster and stretching across multiple data centers. So your etcd and API endpoints are co-located. Um, encountered some storage and performance issues with this. Um, most scenarios, you'd have to have a, a kind of metric connectivity with very little uh, latency at all. Now onto the federated cluster, which is multiple clusters connected by a single control plane. And then our host cluster is the cluster actually running the control plane. And it's kind of the manager of all the clusters. And then lastly, the member clusters of those joined to the control plane. So why CubeFed? 
um, the control plan to manage uh, resources across multiple independent clusters, it's a cloud agnostic, which is an important deciding factor for your, for your application portability. Because you don't want to be locked into AWS, GCP, OpenStack, or vSphere. You want to be able to move your application around as you need to and stand up and move data centers as you need to. The best part about it is that basically any of the API resources in Kubernetes can be federated. This means like your deployments, config maps, secrets, service accounts, all your standard Kubernetes app, um, resources can be federated and applied across multiple clusters. There's no latency requirements. Um, it could be a long, long range uh, latency or low connectivity. Here's an example of a federated site being converted. Um, so your typical deployment is a uh, Kubernetes function to deploy the, your pods, applications, secrets, you know, all the things for a standard deployment. By converting it to a federated deployment, it adds some placements so you can put this application across multiple clusters and then do overrides and move it between the clusters. Um, the KubeFed CTL, which is the CLI for KubeFed, allows you to convert standard um, resource types into federated resource types. So the federated resources are comprised of three main properties. It's going to be your template, placement, and overrides. And I'm going to show you an example here. This is a federated config map. So if you look here, the spec is a template file. So this is a template that gets applied to all three clusters or however many you're using. In this case, we have placement for two. The config map is applied to cluster one and cluster two. And then you can actually do overrides for, cluster, for individual clusters that are going to be customized. So in this case, cluster two has an override for the data path and uh, the values, obviously. What did you say those were? That was uh, all a... Uh Allah has a cat and then Allah has a dog <laughs> in Polish. So one of the ongoing um, discussions for uh, KubeFed in Federation, initially there was a cluster-wide federation, which basically federated the entire cluster and all the resources. Um, since then, there's been discussion to move it into a namespace federation so that only a single namespace is federated. This kind of uh, matches the uh, multi-tenant uh, Kubernetes ideology by keeping it independent of the entire cluster and being able to apply it specifically to namespaces in each cluster. So the cluster scope uh, cube fed is going to handle resources and namespaces cluster-wide, like I was saying. Um, this is going to be required if you're trying to federate cluster resources that are cluster-wide, like a cluster role, cluster role binding, uh, cluster storage classes. Um, basically, you control multiple namespaces in, with one set of cluster-wide relationships. The uh, namespace scoped KubeFed allows for multiple instances of KubeFed operating independently. Um, this is going to provide less uh, role privilege for service accounts, not cluster-wide, only for specific namespaces, and each instance will handle the cluster relationship independently. While trying to federate multiple clusters together, one of the uh, issues that we've run into in addition to uh, trying to get the objects between the clusters is trying to figure out how to get the networking working between the clusters. And so this is mostly just work in progress and identifying key points. Uh, basically, the, one of the first things that you need to figure out is actually how to get a tunnel going between uh, service networks, back in service networks of the clusters. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into that with that is uh, of name or of actually uh, CIDR ranges, the, uh, the actual IP ranges between those. They tend to overlap when you just blindly deploy clusters. And so one of the things you have to do is uh, if you want to build tunnels between clusters, you have to think about that at the um, front end and make sure that the, uh, the internet, the IP ranges are distinct between the clusters. 
so that you can actually get some routing rules. And uh, so you have some tunneling. Routing is an additional issue because you may have some mesh networks or service uh, uh, network uh, like VXLAN in an OpenShift cluster that you you have to get into the rules and adjust how the traffic goes between the clusters. Uh, and once you figured out tunneling and routing, then you have an additional problem where you you want, actually want to be able to use the services from in one cluster in another cluster, and you start to realize that whenever you do lookups of um, of a cluster's uh, DNS, like for, for a service, that it's usually cluster.local. And so putting some sort of naming into that, some sort of cluster identity into that, uh, there's there's some work to be done there. And finally, once you, uh, you get your uh, DevSecOps going, then you need to make sure that your, uh, your network security people are involved and there's some way to put actual network policies into this kind of uh, control so that you, when you do have data going off cluster, you're not violating some sort of policies that you want to avoid. Um, so we're, we're just looking at the technologies right now. One of the, the ones we're kind of fast following right now is Submariner. And Submariner essentially has this concept of setting up a bunch of member clusters and uh, laying what they call undersea cables between them, which are actually just uh, VPN connections. And so we're trying to discuss whether this should move into the uh, Kubernetes multi-cluster SIG, the special interest group, which also handles uh, KubeFed at the moment. And oh my gosh, we left in... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was another dev comp. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the KubeFed operator is how we're deploying in uh, OpenShift 4, and uh, pretty much Operator Hub is what we're trying to move to for deploying anything that's complex. And so there is, there is an operator for KubeFed. There may still be in the uh, Operator Hub and the old version, which was called Federation, but we're moving to uh, KubeFed now. And this is, as I said, it's a supported way when you're going into OpenShift 4 and beyond. And it allows you to do both namespace and cluster scope federation, which you know, I put that in because it wasn't at, at first. It was only uh, namespace at first. And as of slide writing time, we're at a, an 0.1.0 uh, with a, it's not quite the full beta version just yet. I think we're still on like a release candidate five or so, but we're very close to a full beta once we, once the, uh, the team works out some additional issues. And so there, there's one kind of gotcha I wanted to point out here, because when you're talking about uh, single namespace versus cluster-wide, when you install the operator, it actually makes more sense to install the operator to watch a single namespace if you want your KubeFed to do cluster-wide, and vice versa. If you want your uh, KubeFed to be in multiple different namespaces doing single namespace, then you have to make your operator watch all namespaces. So there's just kind of a, a naming kind of disconnect there. But uh, here's the, uh, the link for the operator at the bottom. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Okay, uh, we can, I guess, pull up a cluster. You want to see, like, in a cluster, or just, I think he just wants what to do I mean? Just a uh, verbal example. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that we could install the operator in such a way that it watches one namespace. Does that mean um, we federate the, res the objects in that namespace across to another cluster? Is that what okay. you mean? So, so there's the disconnect, and that's why the, the naming gets kind of confusing. The operator watches for a specific CR, a custom resource called KubeFed, which then instantiates the actual KubeFed controller manager. And so the, all the operators 
operator is doing is waiting for you to drop that kubefed file in either for a cluster-wide version or a specific namespace. And so if you want to do cluster-wide kubefed, then you want a single kubefed CR usually in the kube-federation-system uh, namespace because that's the one that the CLI automatically goes to when it expects to find it. Um, so that's, that's why it's there's a little bit of confusion between the operator. Thanks for the Got question. It. Thank you. Okay, so like I said, we have a lot of teams uh, who are kind of looking into this, and uh, we've identified some challenge spaces that we're still working through. One of them is uh, trying to get uh, DNS and ingress of services into uh, federated clusters with the ability to then switch around regions pretty quickly. Uh, so we, we just have kind of the typical problems that everybody has with DNS at the uh, time to live and um, trying to shorten the amount of time that it takes for changes to happen, but uh, DNS is not uh, cooperative with that. Uh, trying to get uh, multi-cluster storage going uh, is a challenge because if you're thinking about moving uh, apps around, of course, everybody, you know, it's always easy if your apps are stateless. Uh, it's not so much if they're stateful. So we're still trying to work out exactly how federation looks with actual storage rather than just uh, flinging types around. Uh, federating operators themselves would be a really powerful concept. That's something we're still exploring right now. And because operators kind of imply a sort of an ordering to things happening or you know, just the ability to do whatever code that you need, uh, it's harder for it to work in a slap it down and expect it to be eventually consistent kind of model like uh, Kubernetes, which is part of the reason why operators came into existence anyway. So trying to federate that is, is a challenge. Uh, as far as uh, just trying to work out how uh, going beyond something that's in an operator, cr trying to federate applications themselves, and how you do that in the right order such that it works and then can migrate. Uh, we've got some work in that. We have some demos. Um, and then uh, trying to work out what kind of infrastructure concerns, like can you get uh, kubefed to actually federate some of the, the more principal things behind a Kubernetes cluster and uh, allow uh, more admin kind of roles to be federated. Still working on that as well. And uh, the final one is kind of the, uh, the sticky point of day two operations. We like to spin up quick demo clusters, say, hey, look, it works, and shut everything down and forget about tomorrow. And so we always have to come back and write, like, OK, well, how do you ensure that authorization works? How do you ensure that uh, backup and recovery are working? What, what do you do if you need to uh, move a data center? What do you, you know, how does this all work? Okay. So, as I was saying earlier, the GitOps is the kind of a shift from the source of truth being a pile of YAML in a, an admin's directory to the source of truth being in a, a Git repo with uh, proper pull requests and uh, you know kind of the chain of events that have happened and, and uh, sign-offs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so there are a number of tools coming out right now, and we've been looking at a few of these on um, just trying to work on uh, GitOps workflow. And so what we found so far is that, uh, you know, obviously this looks different from what we're doing with KubeFed because it's a pull modality rather than a push kind of idea. Although some GitOps tools do multi-cluster and some of them push and some of them pull to the remote cluster, so there's not even uh, quite consensus on that. Um, and you can you can kind of ba basically you know think of GitOps as uh, just running over and over and over again uh, a kubectl apply or you know an OC apply on a, a set of uh, YAML. So you get the kind of workflow where you're just putting YAML in the a Git repo somewhere, and then there's a container that makes sure that it gets blasted out to the uh, the cluster. 
what we're thinking of with KubeFed is to put KubeFed kind of in between. So you have the GitOps model, but the GitOps is feeding not resources, but federated resources into your cluster. And then that handles the, uh, the multi-cluster. We'd like to do that, not just because we're trying to bet on KubeFed, but because we're, uh, we, we see some value in putting KubeFed in the middle of that. Uh, one of them is that you can set up overrides for the clusters so that the multi-cluster piece of this is more handleable. And uh, so another part of that is uh, replica scheduling preferences. So rather than um, trying to do your your kind of replica count per cluster, uh, KubeFed actually can manage to say something along the lines of, of this set of clusters that I am propagating this resource to, I want to ensure that in copies across these clusters are there, rather than each cluster should have five copies, or maybe that cluster should have three. Although that's, that's what our demos look like right now. We're still working towards exactly what that would look like. Okay. Did you want to drive demo? Or? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. So what we're going to show you here is a, a federated application um, running across three different AWS clusters, one in US uh, East, one in East 2, and then one in West 2. Um, Chandler set it up earlier, and there's an HA proxy listening at a URL. And it's set to automatically do a round robin um, distribution of the application. So what we're going to do is we're going to open it up, and then we're going to open it up again. And we're going to show you in the application how it shows you which zone and which availability zone it's in and which cloud it's in. So we were having some Mongo issues earlier. He said he got some of that stuff fixed. Let's see if he did. It's demo time. Nope, no Mongo still. It's all right. But it's, it's all, all the availability and distribution is what's important. So you see here it's, we're in AWS, and this is East 1. So this kind of highlights one of the big issues with uh, multi-cluster and federation is ingress points. Um, we really need a great solution to be able to go, hey, you're coming in from here, let's push you over here. And there's there's several proprietary load balancing solutions that offer capabilities similar to this, but nothing that's kind of open source, cloud agnostic, um, multi-location, and it's one of the stores we're working on here. This is basically what we're looking at with the, the demo environment. And so, as Davis was mentioning, we have a, a US, I don't know if the cursor comes out on the screen there, uh, US East 1, East 2, East, or, and West on, on the sides here. And so we're running the same set of Mongo database pods across each. They're using uh, Amazon DLB storage, essentially. And we have a Pac-Man pod that's designed to, to work with the, the Mongo database uh, for the high score system. So when the demo is cooperating, what you'll find is that you can uh, run on any of the regions, save your high score, and then the high scores are all saved to the same database, regardless of which region you're running in. And so that's our uh, federated uh, kind of Mongo slash data replication kind of setup. And so essentially the, the Mongo pods within these are 
are all in a replication set, a replica set, which is more specifically outlined in the following slides. <laughs> And there's the, uh, the HA proxy with the uh, essentially just a uh, Route 53 DNS entry that says, okay, well, pacman.sysdesng.com is over there. Or in this case, we, we used uh, pacman-devconf if anybody wants to play. What's important to note is the HA proxy is run on, on the federated control plane. So there is a single, single ingress point for it, and it's distributed between all three data centers. Okay, and so this is where we've got a, a number of our demos. If you want to go and try this out yourself, we, we have some to kind of outline the difference between uh, the scopes, the, the namespace scope versus cluster scope. We have the, the Mongo and the, the Pac-Man as well. And a bunch of useful links. Uh, essentially, there's the upstream project for KubeFed, which is in the Kubernetes Special Interest Group's KubeFed uh, GitHub repo. Uh, once again, with our Federation dev for, uh, for OpenShift-specific demos. We have a, a couple of presentations that went through in KubeCon around uh, Federation KubeFed. Uh, the one from 2018 probably refers to it as Federation V2. Uh, we have a Catacoda scenario, which lets you spin up three uh, kind of test clusters, or two or three test clusters, and then federate them real quickly uh, under the uh, kind of the cover of uh, a Catacoda uh, learning experience. And we have a couple of blog entries, uh, one of them describing the, the process that happened with the, the KubeFed rename, and then uh, actually the, the mixing uh, OpenShift versions is kind of nice. Uh, we, we kind of assumed it would work, but then we actually tested it out. So you can take a 3.x cluster and a 4.x cluster, federate both, and move applications between them. It, it does work as mostly as expected. Which is great for things like migration, if you're migrating from 3x to 4x. All your stateless. No. <laughs> <laughs> your stateless we, we are working on the stateful <laughs> side of that as well. That is also work in progress. OK. Well, that will say thanks and uh, turn it over for questions. Can I just ask a question? You sure. were saying that uh, we can proxies. So the, it's on the same cluster as the federated control plane, is what we meant, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. So basically, there's, got, there's a federated ingress point that has to exist, and it has to point somewhere, which is kind of like the whole ingress dilemma, right? Because you still, while you have three routing points, you still have a single ingress, so you still have a, that, that, that point of failure. Yeah, so if that goes away, then you're sunk, huh? Yeah. yeah that's, that's the goal, right? Find, finding a solution that we'll, we can distribute that between, and then it going away. Within a you know DNS TTL kind of window, yes. There's a great project where they try to do something like this called external DNS, which is a Kubernetes plugin that lets you um, create a service IP or a load balancer IP, and then it'll take that and automatically create a DNS record for your DNS of choice. If you're using Route 53, GCP, Bind, whatever, um, it, it's interactive with all of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned that you're also working on figuring out how to federate operators. Uh, what exactly are you trying to attempt there? Like, is it like have a single controller running on cluster A and have the same controller watch resources on some other cluster as well? That's, that's the basic idea, right. Uh, so the logic dictates that you should just be able to do this, but we're trying to figure out where the... Uh, where the corner cases are. So we're, we're still trying to figure out, you know, if there's something that we should be changing within KubeFed to make this work, or, you know, does this just work? Um, so the other, so the other, other question I had is, uh, when we set up federation across multiple clusters, uh, does whatever sets up the federation also validate the API compatibility between different clusters? Okay. Between the clusters, um, 
like that's let's say you have there's, there's some one. validation that be, that yeah. takes place because like we were saying earlier you can't create a service class unless you have a cluster wide federation um, or you know uh, cluster all cluster all bindings without having a fully federated but for specific resource types I'm not sure yeah I'd, I'd have to uh, defer to the upstream project uh, I imagine that there is something but the uh, so far, most of the uh, validation errors that we hit are local cluster saying something is wrong with the YAML. But it, it's still very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, actually, before we were in here, we were just trying to fix the demo. And uh, our old YAML files were pointing to a cluster context that didn't exist. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, they were pointing to context, cluster context that didn't exist, and we re-ran it, and everything ran fine without an error. And we're like, it's still not working. It's strange. And there's no cluster roles being created in all the clusters. What's going on here? So there, I mean, like, like I'm saying, it's like it's 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 still coming along, right? Um, so the last question I have is: so you showed that you have MongoDB replication across the three clusters. Is that a kubefed managed replication, or is that a MongoDB managed? It's a, it's a MongoDB replica set, okay, right? I mean, this couldn't be done with MySQL because you need a you need back in storage to be replicated right, across. Exactly. So, in it's one of those corner cases, like he was saying, right? So, how many applications, especially enterprise applications, use MongoDB over MySQL or you know whatever? Thank you. It looked like the QFed operator is in one of the data centers in one of the clusters. Uh, what happens when the cluster which is hosting the QFed operator goes down? So essentially, the uh, the reconcile step will no longer be happening, essentially. But the other clusters will continue to run with whatever uh, Kubernetes objects have already been deployed. So for instance, in, in our scenario, if we just knocked out East 1, then East 2 and West 2 would still have Pac-Man. They'd still, you know, this is the important point, have their own uh, reconcile loop going on, making sure that those deployments stay. So if, if they also suffered like node failures, it would ensure that the number of pods are kept up to date and everything. So that's kind of the, the cool thing about KubeFed is that it, it sits on top of the, you know, the Kubernetes reconciler right. as well. Uh, uh, second question is, what would be your recommendation uh, for admins who are going to use this? Uh, should they use only cube fed for all their objects or only for the objects that they want to have federated they go through cube fed and for the rest they just do a oc create using the api master for one of the clusters i think uh it's probably safe to say that you should use uh, KubeFed for the ones that you want to actually federate, uh, because at any point in time, you could also decide, okay, well, I, you know, I, I thought I didn't want to federate this, but I do. You know, that scenario, you can actually just uh, run the KubeFed cuddle uh, federate command and then basically lift that application into federation and then uh, choose its uh, destinations. That may be a good case for the uh, cluster-wide versus namespace uh, federation, right? So if you have a specific namespace, you want to federate versus federating the whole cluster. Okay. Um, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so would this allow pods to communicate inter-cluster as if they're in the same namespace, or is that not what the Federation's goal is? That's not what KubeFed is doing. Uh, that's why we kind of tack on all these other things before we actually say we're done with Federation, right? Uh, that's actually from uh, the, the networking slide where we were talking about uh, Establishing tunnels between the clusters, you got to do that. You have to have the routing working, and then you have to have um, the, the service discovery. That's where the Submariner project he was talking about comes into play. That'll, that'll kind of create those routes, those uh, LTT, LTTV ports, VPNs, and everything for you for cross cluster communication with the SDN. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you.
if you have federation at the namespace level only, um, what kind of permission is required on each one of the uh, member clusters? Is being project admin enough, or do I need cluster admin privilege for that? Okay, when you're joining the clusters, it uh, establishes a service account, and when you are using uh, namespace scoped federation, it only establishes that service account with uh, namespace admin permissions. Very good, no other questions? Cool, what's up? This might be this might be easiest to describe if you go back to your Pac-Man uh, infrastructure slide. Um, so I, I totally get the use case, and uh, it seems very easy to me and makes sense to me when I have like a unified application that I want to run kind of globally, like this Pac-Man service, get it highly available, share state in some sense across these uh, with MongoDB, as you said, across these clusters. Um, what if I kind of wanted these to be private uh, Pac-Man instances? So I was kind of maybe admitting three different Pac-Mans for my three different friends. Um, and I want to keep things in sync, uh, not necessarily the data. I want each friend to have their own kind of copy of the data. Is that a use case for KubeFed? Um, I'm managing multiple Kubernetes clusters. Does that make sense? Is it easy to do? Yeah. I, I think that's a much simpler use case than the one we're trying to get to. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you think it would be yeah. easy to do with KubeFed, something like that? Right. So okay. so rather than all the work that we had to do to, to make Mongo you know, do this replica set, you, you just have a, a Mongo pod. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Good to go. Yeah, any more questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming.